DNA speaks. I'm serious about this. Your DNA, it speaks. It speaks for you. It speaks about you. It speaks without your knowledge. And it speaks without your consent. Now, what in the world could I possibly be talking about? Well, that's what I'm here to explain today. When we walk in the snow or we walk in the sand, we know that we're leaving footprints behind. We can see them. But what we can't see is the invisible trail of DNA that we are leaving in our wake everywhere we go. Every time you use a plastic coffee cup and you throw it in the trash, every time you leave a conference room with a used napkin behind, you are leaving a microscopic trail of DNA that anybody can freely and legally pick up, take to a lab, and for a couple hundred bucks, have analyzed and get all kinds of information about you that is encoded in your DNA. Now, why, what is it that DNA is saying about us? How can it talk about us? And why do I care so much about it? Well, as a professor of constitutional law and scholar in the area, I am constantly thinking about the way in which new technologies and scientific discoveries can create ripples in our social institutions, ripples that make us rethink the way in which we govern ourselves, ripples that make us re-ask questions that are central to our civil liberties, questions like, what is speech? What does it mean to communicate with each other in this new technological age? What is privacy? Is it important anymore? Does it even exist? And what I have been doing in rethinking these questions, for example, in the context of computer code, is looking at how using computer code to communicate with each other can be an exercise of our freedom of speech and it, how its regulation can actually affect the privacy of those communications. Now, in thinking about code, I realize DNA is a lot like computer code. In fact, DNA is a lot like our regular language itself. To make this clear, you have to look a little closer at the DNA molecule. You see, DNA is composed of a strand that carries in it, among other things, four different types of smaller molecules that scientists refer to in shorthand as A, T, C, and G. Now, these molecules are, alternate in all kinds of combinations, and they basically take the place that the ones and the zeros would take in computer code. They really take the place that the letters in our alphabet take in our regular English language. And by arranging those letters in different ways, we can form the words, the sentences, the paragraphs of the messages that our DNA carries and conveys. Meaning is etched into every single cell of our bodies. Now, isn't that a mind-blowing concept? If you think about it, DNA is language. So the question is, what stories is DNA telling about us? Well, anybody who's watched a TV crime drama in the last 20 years or so knows that if you leave a little bit of your hair or of your blood behind in a crime scene, you are in trouble, right? <laughs> the CSI guys are going to find you and they're going to put you away for a long time. But even more than that, DNA doesn't just identify an individual among many. It also encodes for the specific physical traits of that individual. DNA also recounts the history of our ancestors. It tells stories about where we come from. And so, for example, an interesting and unexpected way in which all this information can be used is the work of an artist, Heather Dewey Hagborg who picks up tiny pieces of trash that people leave behind on the streets, things like chewing gum or a cigarette butt. And then she takes the DNA that is left in those things, extrapolates the information that she gets from them to create an approximation of the likeness of the person that left it behind. 
Now, wouldn't it be insane if you walked into the Guggenheim Museum one day <laughs> to find a sculpture that has this eerie resemblance to your own face? Now, that would be a little crazy, but not such a big deal. After all, our faces are out there. Everybody can see them. But DNA can do more than that. It can also not just tell us what our bodies look like today, but how they might change into the future. So, for example, DNA has been shown to predict the likelihood that you might get a certain disease. Now, picture this situation. You're at an insurance agent's office. You're filling out the paperwork for a life insurance policy. And there's a cup of water that the agent brings you. You take a couple of sips. You fill out the paperwork. You leave. The agent then takes that cup for literally four or five hundred bucks today, probably at 150, 200 in a couple of years, the way things are going, can get a report back that says all kinds of things, like, for example, you are 30% more likely to contract breast cancer in the future. Now, he gives you a call, and he says, we have a great deal for you. We're knocking off some, of the, some from your premium. All you have to do is waive coverage over death caused by breast cancer. Right? <laughs> Now, maybe you don't have a history of breast cancer in your family for whatever reason, and you think this is a sweet deal. But what you don't realize is that you are actually in a fundamentally unfair bargaining position because he knows more about you than you know about yourself. The way that this can influence your decisions is quite troubling, but even more interesting are studies that are being done as we speak that show that not just our bodies, but the things that we do, and even the things that we might think, might be, to some extent, predicted by our DNA. So some studies have shown a correlation between one particular gene and somebody's propensity for violence. Another study has shown a correlation between another gene and a person's ideology, whether he's more likely to be liberal or conservative. Now, to be fair, some of these studies are very, in their very early stages, and some of them might pan out, some of them might not. But what is undeniable is the fact that every day scientists learn more and more about how our DNA says things about who we are and who we might become in the future. For me, this is particularly troubling because by using all this information, other people can manipulate our choices. By limiting and carefully curating the options that are presented before us, others can create the illusion of choice, but a reality of predetermined outcomes. Now, this is not just hypothetical. This is already happening. How many of you have performed a search on Google or in Amazon? You do it first in your computer, you get a certain set of results, then you want to show a friend, and you do it in their computer, and you get a completely different set of results. Why does this happen? Well, because these websites are tracking the websites you've been to, the links you've clicked on, the products you've browsed, the things you've liked on Facebook, the GPS locations where you have been. And using all that information, they can't predict what you will like and what you will not like. Now, imagine if they had all the information about you that is contained in your DNA. So picture this situation, right? You are looking for the news of the day, and you go into Google, and Google knows that you have this gene that supposedly can code for your liberal tendencies. And then, instead of giving you the Wall Street Journal, they might give you the New York Times, right? Instead of, if you're looking at foreign sites, instead of giving you the London Times, they give you Al Jazeera, because those are allegedly more liberal websites, right? Now, the problem with this is it creates what Professor Cass Sunstein has called an echo chamber effect. You are being fed l only liberal constructions of the truth because you are supposedly a liberal person. And that alienates you from other versions of the truth. Now, this is particularly disturbing in the context, or problematic, in the context of a democracy and a republican form of government in which we are all supposed to engage in a free, open, rigorous discussion of different ideas. And what's worse, you don't even know this is happening. So you are unlikely to take corrective action. 
Along those lines, have you guys noticed anything weird about this picture? <laughs> if you look a little closer, you'll notice that it's an on-on switch, right? You don't really have a choice. It looks like you have a choice, but it's really just an illusion. Now, I don't want anybody freaking out, right? That's not the purpose of the talk. I don't want you to go, oh my god, what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah, I just dropped DNA on the stage. <laughs> and, and that's part of the problem, right? You can't stop this from happening. Your DNA is going to be out there. People are going to get to it. So, and the other thing is, it's all good, right? There is a lot of benefits we get from having and sharing this DNA information. We can get new technologies, new scientific discoveries. We can get new cures for diseases. We can get all sorts of comfort and convenience in our lives, be able to lead healthier lives by having more information. What we need to do, though, is set reasonable limits on how other people can use that information, who gets to use it, and for what purposes. Now, all of the examples I've talked about today are profitable, they're affordable, and they are perfectly legal. Now, the question you might have is, how can that be, right? Don't I have a constitutional right to privacy? What happens with my freedom of, of expression and my freedom to not speak about myself? Well, the answer is that we tend to forget the Constitution protects us from government action. It doesn't protect us from the actions of private parties and corporations. And so, what can we do about all this, right? Well, the first thing that we need to do is snap out of this mentality, passive and complacent, that says there is no harm in sharing my information. We tend to think, well, I have no secrets to hide, right? So there's no harm in people knowing these things about me. Well, I hope that today some of the examples I've given you have made you realize that even perfectly innocent information can be used in harmful and unfair ways. And the key realization here is that privacy is not just about keeping secrets. Privacy is also about guaranteeing our ability to make informed, and intelligent and free choices regarding what we do. Now, the way in which we can get to that place where it is not the corporations or the private entities that are creating the rules solely for their own profit, but rather we the people that are calling the shots, is twofold. First, we can legislate. Right? And so what we need to do is talk to our representatives in government. Let them know how we feel about this. And if you're frustrated with DC, I, I get you. We all are. State representatives, local government can also get involved. Second, and perhaps more importantly, we all have great power as consumers. Right? Use your influence in the market. The next time you're choosing a bank, an insurance agency, a text messaging app, or soon enough, the latest cutting edge health app or toilet that reads your DNA, make sure that they have the right privacy policies um, in place. We have to make it both illegal and unprofitable for people to disrespect our private choices and try to manipulate us. Thank you for listening today, and I hope tomorrow you go out there and speak up. <laughs>